we're all walking around in this world and our talents and our gifts are like this encrypted message within us. I think sometimes when people are really doing something that's in their strength, they're radiating in ways that they can't necessarily perceive, but if the people around them could feel it. I want to help other people see who they could become. It's very clear to me who other people could be, and I want them to see it just as clearly. Welcome to The Art of Speaking Up, a podcast that helps professional women access the limitless potential that lies within them. I'm your host, Jessica Guzik, and my mission is to help you find that spark inside you that has the power to transform your career in ways you may not have thought possible. I'm so excited that you're here, and now on to the show. Welcome to The Art of Speaking Up. If you're new here, welcome. And if you're not new, you may have noticed that the music is changed and I'm really excited about it. I've been very excited to change the music and I hope that you like it too. And I'm really excited about today's episode because it's on what is possibly my favorite topic ever, which is the things that we are good at and the areas where we are strong and how we can bring those out in our jobs and in our careers to have more fun, to get better results, and to feel more satisfied in our day-to-day work. And it was such a treat to chat with today's guest, not only because her energy is so positive and glowy and wonderful, and I am sure that you will sense it when you hear this conversation, but also because strengths are her specialty. We actually ended up talking for quite a while. This was almost a 90-minute conversation, so I'm going to put it out in two different episodes, one this week and another one next week. Today's episode is all about how knowing your strengths and how understanding the unique combination of what you are good at can help you grow and accelerate professionally. Today's guest, Caitlin, you will hear her talk about this. She is certified in a modality called Gallup Strengths. And this is something that a lot of companies use for employees. It's a test that you can take online and it basically tells you what your top five strengths are from a list of 34 strengths. And Caitlin has, as you will hear, the skills and the know-how to take people's results on this assessment and really help them figure out what it means and how they can bring it out more in their jobs. In this conversation, we talk about what it means to know what you're good at and why it's so helpful. And do not worry at all if you haven't taken the Gallup Strengths Finder test. You don't need to have taken it to get value out of this conversation. We talk a lot in general about the value of knowing what you're good at, how to start to figure that out and get closer to it, and how Caitlin likes to work with people to help them bring that out more in their professional lives. I hope you enjoy this. Part two, which is coming out next week, is all about something that I'm personally obsessed with, and so is Caitlin. So it was a really fun conversation possibly one of the funnest ones that I've had. And it's all about the Myers-Briggs type indicator, which is like Gallup, a test that you take online and it tells you what type you are. And in next week's conversation, you're going to hear Caitlin talk about how knowing your type can really help you understand some of the experiences that you have at work, both the good ones and the struggles. And it was so, so, so much fun. So with that, I'm going to cut into my conversation with Caitlin. I hope you enjoy it. At the end, when you hear me in the outro, I will let you know what my top five strengths are on the Gallup Strengths Assessment because I just found out what they are. So if you listen through to the end, you will find out too. But for right now, let's meet Caitlin and I hope you enjoy the conversation. Thank you, Jessica. I'm so excited to be here. So I am a Myers-Briggs Type Indicator Certified Practitioner, and I am also a Gallup Certified Clifton Strengths Coach. My background, I have a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's degree in leadership development. Took a little detour in between and did two years in a master's program for counseling because I thought I wanted to be a therapist, and I'm sure we'll touch on that later. But yeah, so the work that I do is I basically do both individual coaching with people to interpret their results for their personality types and their strengths. And I do the same in workplaces to help with team building and team communication. Your work focuses on strengths because uncovering strengths are a huge theme in this show. And I wanted to get your thoughts on 
what you think about someone who isn't necessarily getting a lot of feedback at work. I think some work cultures, people will get more feedback than others. For people who aren't regularly having those conversations, why is it important to start building awareness of the things that we're good at and the places where we have superpowers? Yeah, it's super important. Unfortunately, in the workplace, it traditionally or historically, it's been a lot more around a model of having an annual review. And a lot of times in that annual review, it's customary to, yeah, spend a little bit of time on what you're doing well, but primarily it's looking at, okay, where can you do even better? Where can there be improvement? And yes, it's important to look at, at improvement, but the thing is, so many of us, we take for granted what we're good at and we don't always see it in ourselves. It's We can see it in other people all day long, but it, it's really hard to see in ourselves. I like to say it's the water that we swim in. We don't even recognize it for what it is. So then when you're in the workplace and you're getting your review and the person giving you your review isn't telling you what the things are that you're doing well, because maybe they think you see it because they see it then you start to wonder, well, what am I really good at? So it can be a little disheartening. And so the reason I love assessments like Clifton Strengths is because it gives language to something that was just so dif- is so difficult for us to put words to. I like to say that it's kind of like we're all walking around in this world and our talents and our gifts are like this encrypted message within us. And we don't know how to crack it. And a lot of times other people crack it for us because they like have the decoder ring and they can see it for what it is, but we can't read our own. Um, And so I try to be, I try to remember that, you know, when I work with clients, I, I need them just as much as they need me because I may have the decoder ring because I've studied these things forever, but they have this new encrypted message I've never seen before that it's my job to make sense of. And so when you get to see your results, it's like you finally see that message that's been within you and it's now on paper in front of you. And it's describing you in ways that resonate, but you never may have been able to put words to before. When you look back on your life from the time you were a kid, it might make sense. Oh, of course, my teachers used to tell me I was good at that or, oh yeah, this makes sense. But we just weren't seeing it because we were maybe too focused on the class we were getting a C in instead of thinking about everything we're getting the A's and B pluses in. And so I say that my goal in working with people on these things is to help them be able to intentionally and mindfully use the tools in their toolbox moving forward. And when you sit down with someone who hasn't done this exploration before and you show them their results and you walk them through it, are you finding that people are surprised? What kind of experience is that as they kind of get to see this information for the first time? Yeah, there's a mixture. I think sometimes it's sort of like you mentioned, it's things that we intuitively know are within us and then we see it and it goes, oh yeah, that makes sense. Sort of like when you see an invention that's just a slight twist on something that previously existed and you're like, I never would have thought of that, but yes, that's great. So that's often what it is. It's it's sort of validation. Oh, I thought I was good at that, but now I'm seeing it here written in black and white that I really am. But sometimes people are surprised that something is considered a strength. It might be something like somebody I met the other day and we went over their strengths. Uh, she said, I always felt like people thought I was a know-it-all because I had a lot of information that I like to share about all different topics. But now that I look at this and I see that I have this this talent or this strength of input. And input is basically a person who, they just love inputting data into their brain. They like to read a bunch of news stories. They like to learn new things constantly. They love to just pick up things from other people and they store it in all these areas of their brain. It's like the person you'd see on Jeopardy where you go, how can you even remember that fact? And they just love to pull it out whenever they need it. And so now she realized, oh, it's actually a strength that maybe just wasn't being fully embraced and or fully explained to the people I was using it around. And so now she knows how to use it. I love that so much. And it kind of leads into the next question about downplaying our strengths or having troubles. I know as women, a lot of times we have troubles with this idea of saying, I'm good at this and making that assertion and that declaration. Is that something that you see or pick up on when you're working with people and kind of uncovering this with them? Definitely. So not to switch it to a male example, but the first thing that just popped in my head is my husband has the strength of harmony, 
just liking things to be going well in your environment. And just for some people, it's physical environment. They want clear. My mom has harmony also, but for her, it's the physical environment. She wants it to be all organized. For other people, it's their emotional environment. They want it to be harmonious. Anyway, I don't think that he thought much of it when he saw it. Like, oh, okay, yeah, harmony. And I've told him for years, everyone has always told him, you make everyone feel so calm around you. And what he doesn't realize, because he's a firefighter paramedic, and to have that energy and that strength in front of people when they are maybe having the worst day of their lives is so powerful. And he definitely downplays. And so many of us do this. Like, oh, well, what's the big deal? Everybody's good at that, aren't they? But they aren't. Yeah. And also another one is, well, how can I apply this? Doesn't apply to work. How can I apply this in a professional setting? Mm-hmm. Well, it, and I would definitely say it absolutely does because, um, as one of my counseling professors said, and it's always stuck with me, the way we do anything is the way we do everything. So if I'm going to be one way in my personal life, it's definitely going to leak over and and be similar in my professional life. So if you are the person in that harmony example, if you're the person who's bringing about harmony with your friends, you're going to be kind of playing that similar role in the workplace too. Um, These are all transferable strengths and skills. And that's such an important skill at work. Is there a place, because I'm now like feeling curious and wanting to read the list of strengths and get familiar with them. Is there a place you would recommend to go to learn more about them? Yes, um, Gallup, G-A-L-L-U-P. So it's gallupstrengthscenter.com. I'm pretty sure that I took the test a few years ago and my number one was competitiveness. Ah, which is not very common, actually. Really? Yeah, it's not super common. So competition, I love this one. So um, when you talk about transferable skills, so one of the little things that we do in workshops is I'll ask people to stand up if you always do X, Y, Z. And the point is to demonstrate that we do these things in our daily lives and don't realize that it, we're exhibiting some of our strengths by doing it. And one of them is stand up if you always have to have someone to race while driving. You know, like you pick somebody out on the road. <laughs> and and ev- almost every single group I've ever been in, there's this hesitation. And then one person stands up. And almost always, it's because they have that competition strength. And what that means is basically that you do better when you watch others perform. So that is what motivates you to then perform yourself. So it can be really cool. And and to know that about yourself can then help you purposely leverage that strength in life and maybe pick someone to compete with when you want to get something done or have an accountability partner or something like that. That's so interesting. I think I want to redo it. I'm fascinated. Do they change or do they tend to stay the same if you take the test like a few years later? So they tend to stay the same. I did my own little personal experiment. The first time I took it was about six or seven years ago and I had the top five that I got. And then I got really attached to them because especially after becoming a certified coach in it, I talk about my five all the time. But I had changed a lot in my late 20s, early 30s. And so I thought, well, I really ought to take it again and just see. So I took it again a couple months ago and I was answering questions in what I thought was a very different way than I had before and was feeling kind of bummed, just anticipating I was going to have different strengths. And I get the results and in a different order, but all the same five. And so sometimes people will come to me and say, oh, some of mine changed over the years. But if they were to look at their full list, they'd probably find that the ones that shot up into the top five had always existed in numbers like six through 10. So as I mentioned, you know, there may not be a great difference in your level of talent or potential in something between maybe you have just as much potential as for your number one as you do for your number seven or eight, but they had to go in some order. For your top five, could you share maybe one or two that are the ones that you I guess, enjoy the most or are most proud to have? Yeah. um, Oh, gosh. So I'll share all of them in case anyone listening wants to relate. And then I'll pick that'll help me pick my five or my two. Um, So my first one is strategic, which I was surprised to get the first time um, because I always thought of myself as very touchy feely. And most of my family is more that strategic thinking, logical, rational thinking. And I always thought that wasn't me. Um, And then I had positivity. And I have woo, which this always makes me laugh. It stands for winning others over. Uh, But I'm always embarrassed to share it because I might not be winning over the person right in front of me at that moment. Um, And then communication and connectedness. Um, So my 
I would say that my favorites that I think get me through life in a way that I really enjoy the positivity. It definitely helps me just keep moving forward even when I think that I can't. And also helps me in the work that I do because I believe in other people so much and I want to help other people see who they could become. It's very clear to me who other people could be and I want them to see it just as clearly. I think, yeah, that's so special when you can see something for someone else. Yeah. And I, I, I kind of see it as this, like I said, it's like that, that code and encrypted message thing. It's almost this duty that I feel, you know, if, if I can see it, I need to say it. And, and I think that so many of us, um, I don't know, I'm trying to remember the story that this is. I don't know if it's um, the, the imagery of heaven versus hell, where in hell, there are the people with the long spoons and they're all starving because they can't reach their mouths with the spoons. And then the person goes, I, I don't know if this is, this is from a play, I'm sure. And I don't know. I, I know that it's very famous and it's just not coming to me at the moment. Somebody listening will know. And then this person then went to heaven to, to see what the difference is. And they also had these long spoons, you know, with this porridge in front of them or whatever. And they were all happy and laughing and doing well. And the difference was they were reaching across and feeding one another. Oh, I love that so much. Isn't that sweet? So I always think, you know, I, that's how I see all of us helping one another. Let me, let me hold up the mirror to you because you're not able to do it for yourself. Especially with the things that we're good at too, because I think sometimes when people are really doing something that's in their strength, they're radiating in ways that they can't necessarily perceive, but if the people around them could feel it. Yes. It's sort of like, you know, we all get used to, <laughs> this is kind of a fun example, but you know, you don't know what you, your scent is, <laughs> you know, what somebody else might be able to tell. So it's sort of eliminating all these other factors. So somebody's making it so you can like, we'll assume it's a floral scent so that you can smell your floral scent again, you know, you're, cause you're so used to it and that you just can't, you can't, smell it, see it for what it is when you have these things that are just so, such a part of you. That makes a lot of sense. And for someone who is getting curious now about what they might be good at, are there things that they could start to pay attention to or ways they can broaden their awareness throughout the day to try to start getting clues about where their strengths might be? Yes. So I kind of describe this as like when I went through my counseling um, courses and we did so much inner work because to be a therapist, you you really have to figure yourself out as much as possible first before you help others. And I always say it kind of gave me this, what I feel like is a superpower now, like in the matrix when everything just slows down and you can see it all. So for the strengths, like I said earlier, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. For me, I noticed that strategic strength that I didn't see in my life before. Suddenly I started to notice that like when I was getting ready in the morning, uh, my mind was constantly playing things through like, okay, and then I'm going to walk out to the garage to go get my stuff from the dryer. But on the way there, the most efficient thing to do would be to grab the trash and throw that out while I'm in the garage. And, you know, I was constantly, constantly figuring out all these things. And I realized, oh, I do use that strategic thing all the time. No wonder it's number one. But it was just the way that I thought. I didn't think there was anything about it. So um, just paying attention to those little things. But also, I think a really great way to know what you're good at is to start thinking about what are the things that people talk to me about? Like I said, the whole thing with knowing your own scent or like you've never been in a room where you weren't before. We don't always know how we affect things around us. So all we know is, oh, yeah, of course, my friends and I always talk about like for me, we always talk about strengths and Myers-Briggs. This is just what our conversations are. But surely my friends go and have different kinds of conversations with other people. So if I start really looking at what is it that I find myself talking about with people that they come to me about, you know, so if somebody starts noticing, what is it that my friends and family come to me to discuss? Um, do they ask me for advice? Do they come to me for consolation? Do they come to me for fun? You know, what is it? And recognizing patterns in that. This kind of plays off of that a little bit. When you mentioned this to me, I was super intrigued. You talked about context and how we change depending on the context we're in and how that kind of can relate to what we're good at and what we're not as good at. Can you share that with everyone? Because that was something I hadn't really thought about. And it was so interesting. 
Yeah. Um, so I'll use an example of my own and also a more famous example. So my own example is with that positivity piece. So um, as I mentioned earlier, I spent two years in a master's program for counseling, which I enjoyed very much. And I always tell people, yeah, I joined, I spent two years. I don't have the degree to show for it, but what I learned in it has taught me so much. And it's really informed all the work that I do. So it was a really good experience. What I started to notice about it when we did sort of mock counseling sessions in my courses was I would get feedback sometimes of, hey, Caitlin, it's really good. You're so positive, but it's really important in therapy to let clients sort of sit in discomfort sometimes so that they can learn to work through it and validate that they're going through a tough time and really listen and, you know, sit there with them in it before trying to look for silver linings or see the the positive potential possibilities and outcomes. And so I would keep trying to do that in all my sessions and, and sit with it because it's a really important part of therapy. They were absolutely right with their feedback. But then I started to feel over time, like I was really suppressing this very powerful thing within myself. And it was during that time when the place that I worked at the time when I was going through that program, we took what was then called StrengthsFinder, now Clifton Strengths, and I got my results. And when I saw positivity was my number two, it was just this big aha moment. And I thought, I think while positivity is helpful as a therapist, for sure, I think it can be something that's even more helpful and powerful and part of what I should be doing on a daily basis in another type of job. And around then is when I made the decision that I was just going to make a slight pivot to help people in a slightly different way. And so now in the context of being a coach and getting people pumped and excited about what they're capable of and what they're good at, that positivity is what keeps me fueled and I think is what makes me way better at what I do. I think that's so helpful. And I also think it speaks to this idea of exploring whether we might want to change our context and our surroundings if something isn't working versus always hammering on ourselves. Because I think it's really easy to get in this pattern of, you know, I just need to always fix myself and adjust myself to be able to fit in this situation. And I think it's less common for us to think in that very powerful way, which is, am I in the right context? And should I be thinking about changing all the things around me rather than changing myself? I mean, it's obviously case by case, but I think it's such a powerful way to look at a problem. Right. I think about it like the 80% and 20%. None of us is going to have a job where we never have to do something we don't want to do. 80% of the time you're doing something that you feel is just so out of your realm, not in your strength zone, and just so unnatural for you and something that you're trying to force. I think that's, you know, becomes time to question, is this the right place? Not, is there something wrong with me? So you keep flowing me into the next question. (laughs) And the next one is about the things that we're not as good at. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about our relationship with the things that we're not as good at. I think part of the reason that I spend a lot of time thinking about it is because there's kind of this illusion in the professional world that you have to be good at everything. And I don't know, there's almost it feels like a little bit of a facade that everyone puts on where it's like, I am superhuman, there's nothing that I'm not good at, which isn't true. So I've spent a lot of time being like, what do I think the real solution is to the things that we're not good at? And I'm curious to hear your perspective from the work that you do. So I would say that I have sort of two answers to that. So I think you're absolutely right. I think that in school, you know, when we, like I said, we look at our report cards and we focus on the things where we have B's and C's and D's and instead of you know, celebrating and looking at the A's and then going, okay, well, you know, we'll work on those things. And that makes sense, especially when we're young, because you want to be able to have certain basic skills out in the world. You need to be able to do your addition and subtraction and be able to read and do these different things to be as successful as you can be. But the older we get, when we get beyond our general education, it's not necessary anymore to stare at the areas where we aren't doing quite as well to the detriment of focusing on the areas where we are. And so we have this idea in the workplace, a lot of times, like I said, we get that annual review and we could be doing amazing things in certain areas. And then there were a couple of things where we weren't perfect. And maybe that's where the focus goes, unfortunately. And I I wouldn't even fault managers or bosses. I think it's just a systemic issue that for so long, that's just been the way we do things. But the way that Gallup um, sees this with the whole theory with Clifton Strengths is they talk about people can be sharp. So if you picture a pie. The people can be like sharp pieces that are very, very, you know, tuned in to the things that they're specifically good at. And they they really work hard at those and they're amazing and they're who you want for the job. And when you put all those pieces together, it makes a well-rounded team. So 
what I think when you're considering, when you look at your weaknesses, I think there are two things that you can do. One, you can look around at your team or your family or whatever it may be and say, is there somebody I can tap into who has complementary strengths to mine and can I ask for their help? And like you said, sometimes it can be hard to ask for help because we feel like we should be able to do everything. But actually asking for help and giving help makes people feel more connected to each other and makes them feel, you know, it kind of builds the relationship too. And also, I can't remember where I heard this, but asking for help makes people trust you more too, because they know that you'll admit when you need it. So you can ask other people for their assistance in helping you make up for the areas that aren't your greatest strengths. Also, what you can do, though, is leverage the strengths that you have to sort of mimic the areas of growth. So, for instance, for me, when I did my training for Clifton Strengths, I was paired up with a woman who had all the strengths that I wish I had, like focus, discipline, responsibility, all these things. And she was paired up with me and she was going, woo, positivity, I want those. And so we were talking through it, how, you know, the grass is always greener. And I said, oh, but I'm just so sad. I don't have focus and discipline because how am I going to make any of my dreams reality? And she said, well, look at the other things that you have. You have strategic and you come up with plans. And your positivity gets you really excited to execute those plans. So you you may not have focus or discipline, but when those things are combined together, they can mimic what focus and discipline do. You can get to the same result through different means. And so to go to that toolbox analogy, it's sort of like, ah, I don't have a screwdriver, but I have this uh, piece of metal, you know, or I have this credit card that I can stick in there and it can act as a screwdriver, you know, so it's, it's leaning into the strengths that you have and leveraging them to make up for those areas if if it's a circumstance where it doesn't make sense to find another person outside of yourself. Totally. And maybe you don't have a screwdriver, but you're like, holy cow, I have a drill. <laughs> you know? Oh my gosh. Yes, absolutely. Could have an even better result. Yeah. So when you have a strength like strategy or positivity or winning others over, I mean, focus and discipline, you could make the argument that they become irrelevant in a way, because you could say that you're going to rally some people and they're going to discipline through the thing that you need done. And they're going to feel super excited about it because of how you made them feel. Oh, thank you. That, that's the hope, right? Yeah, I have, I have a friend who has some of those that, that I don't have. And we've taught, you know, we all have different things. So it's different contexts. She was in a really rigorous academic program. And I, I asked something about feeling passionate about it. And she was like, no, to me, it's more a challenge. And I just like to do something that requires discipline of me and focus of me because she's really good at those things. Whereas for me, my motivation would have to be totally different. I could only get through something rigorous if it was something I was feeling really positive about and really, you know, really, really passionate to get it done. And so this is where different types of people can do similar things, but for completely different reasons, using completely different strengths. I love that. And I think it's so fascinating too, how we have these innate differences and we can't totally explain why or understand why, but it's just like something totally different lights you up than lights her up. And I think that in and of itself is really cool and special. Me too. And that's what I love about this is every single person I see, especially when you start layering assessments on each other. Oh, you're this personality type with those strengths, because you can have people with the same personality type have a completely different set of Clifton strengths, you know, with their top five. So it can look very different. And it just reminds you that I think some people are often turned off by assessments because they might get the impression that it's about boxing people or categorizing and labeling. And to me, it's actually a way to assess nuance instead of throwing two people into a box like, oh, you're both outgoing and talkative. You're the same. You know, that, that can be easy to do. But if I go, oh, no, you're outgoing, but then you really need to go think about your feelings by yourself and you're outgoing, but you really want to go think through analytical problems by yourself, you know, it's going to look very different. And I love to be able to, to look at this whole picture. It's like this kaleidoscope where everything starts kind of falling into place as you get different things that you're throwing in there into the picture. Oh yeah. I love it so much. And I think it's really something that everyone should have a chance to do and should have a chance to explore. I think that's why the work that you do is so special because in the perfect dream scenario, you know, everyone would be in a workplace where they have a great manager who's super engaged in their personal development and knows enough to help them kind of get to some of these insights. But I don't think everybody 
gets that situation. And I, I think that there's so much power in just spending that time and effort really understanding these things because it can take your work to another level and probably also your job satisfaction to another level, I would guess. Absolutely. They find that uh, people, I think it's they're three times more likely to report a greater quality of life when they're dealing with getting strength feedback in the workplace. And they're something like six times more engaged in their jobs. Because as it stands, um, Gallup found that only 30% of people would say that they're actively engaged in their jobs. What they found was more than your role, more than your title, more than your salary, what led to that engagement and that satisfaction, that quality of life was whether you were getting to utilize the things that you're naturally good at and feel purposeful and and find meaning in the work that you're doing. It's such a win-win. And if people are feeling curious about how to take this test, can you share how it works? And then after that, we'll go into how to reach you and what type of work you do with people. Yeah, um, there are two. Well, there are three ways really to, to do that. One is you can go to, like I mentioned earlier, the Gallup Strengths Center, the G A L L U P strengthcenter.com. And there you can purchase a code. Um, you can do just the top five. You can purchase one that's a little more to see all 34 in order. You can also get a code through the book, which can be purchased on Amazon. Um, it's the Clifton Strengths. 2.0. So you can, but you want to make sure you get a new one that has a code. So if it's used, you probably wouldn't be able to use the, the code, but um, so you can do it through the, through the book or directly online. You can also, you could Google to find somebody like me or also on the um, Gallup has a coaches directory where you can find people in your area who uh, like me, where you could get the code through us and pay for a session to get the results interpretation. So it just depends what level of, you know you want to get into it. Perfect. And if someone is wanting to work with you on this, how can they get in touch with you? And I guess what would you want them to know? Yeah. Um, so the way they get in touch is my website. It, that is my first and last name. It's CaitlinHockett.com. C-A-I-T-L-I-N. And then Hockett's a little difficult. H-A-W-E. K-O-T-T-E. So that's CaitlinHockett.com. And they can find me there. They can contact me through there. Um, what I would want them to know, well, and I have my pricing on there too. What I would want them to know is just that it is even more exciting and and life-changing, I feel, from what I've seen in other people and what I've personally experienced than you might even think it is. It seems simple to just find out five strengths, but really it's changed the way that I see and do everything. It made me change master's programs. It made me change career trajectories. So yeah, it can be very, very powerful. Oh, I love it. It's, I mean, it's fundamentally getting to know yourself, which is a really special thing. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it's amazing that it's basically a lifelong, never ending journey to, to figure out who we are and, and, and discover it, but also create it. Yeah, for sure. And enhance it and use it to build what we want, because it can be really empowering to have the paradigm of, I know that this is a place where I really shine and I'm going to use that to achieve my goals. And I think it's helpful too to have a tool like this because it can be very hard, I think, for us to own what we're good at. And I think in a way, it's sort of nice to have this ability kind of objective tool that's like, well, this is telling me that these are my strengths. So I, it's time for me to own it. (laughs) Like this, I'm sure it was built with tons of research and all of these things behind it. And, you know, I think it's sometimes just hard for us and hard for women to really own it. And I think having that tool just tell you kind of gets you past that leap that you have to make that can feel really uncomfortable sometimes. Yes. It's almost like when you have somebody who can vouch for you as a warm connection to someone else. It's this thing we've all decided, you know, and so many people have taken it at this point. If you go into a job interview and they say, well, what would you say are your greatest strengths? You can say, oh, well, I recently took the Clifton Strengths assessment and it said I have. The, and odds are they may have already taken it themselves. Maybe they've done some work with it in their in their businesses. And even if they haven't, it's it's sort of like this. You've got a name behind you. <laughs> you've got some legitimacy behind what you're saying are your strengths. So it can be really helpful. Final question. This was inspired by the inspiration for the show, which was a time in my career where I was feeling pretty overwhelmed and I didn't have any mentors and 
I really needed support and empowerment. And I love to give this last space to the guest to share whatever they would want to share with someone who might be in that space or just someone who's really looking to uncover and connect with their boldness and courage in their life and at work. Yeah. So I had this quote that I'd been thinking of that I thought I would share I'm, I'm a huge quotes. If anyone wants to follow me on Pinterest, I have like thousands of quotes pinned on there. Um, so, you know, with my intuition and my perceiving, it's very hard to pick one, but I, but I picked one. So JK Rowling had this quote that said, we do not need magic to transform our world. We carry all the power we need inside ourselves already. Just even reading that, it makes me want to cry because I think that Every single one of us has, and I, I don't mean for this to sound cliche or, you know, overly idealistic, but I truly, truly, I think everyone has something within them that is so individual and special and such an amazing combination of traits and experiences and skills and talents and viewpoints and, you know, just so many things that we all miss out on if we don't get from one another. So I, I think there can be no, for me, there's like no greater work in life than, than figuring out what that is for yourself and sharing it with everybody. And, um, and so that, that's why I love what I do. There, there's another quote. Um, oh God, I'm not going to remember who it's from, but it said there's the day there, I, it might be a Mark Twain or something. You might know it. Uh, there are two days that we're born in our life or two or two days, something like this, where it's the, the day that you're born and the day you find out why. And I think about that all the time. I feel like I had almost a rebirth when I discovered these things about myself and could put words to who I am and what I bring and, you know, why I feel like I matter. And like we talked about earlier, when you have assessments like this that almost feel like backing you up, that this is true of you, um, suddenly you can kind of really, really believe and embrace the fact that you matter and that you know, you have something of value to bring and everyone will be all the better for it. Oh my gosh. I loved that so much. Thank you so much, Caitlin. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to my conversation with Caitlin. I loved her. It was so much fun talking with her and I hope you enjoyed listening. I will say if you're thinking about reaching out to her or taking the Gallup Strengths Assessment or any of that stuff, I would personally encourage it. I think knowing what you're good at is one of the most powerful things you can do for yourself in your career. And it's something that will last you for a very long time. And it's been very, very helpful for me. I will link the assessment in the show notes. I will link Caitlin's information in the show notes in case you want to reach out to her. And of course, I promise that I would share my results with you. So I just took the assessment and drum roll. Here they are. And this is interesting because I took it several years ago and I think most of them stayed the same, although not all of them, a couple of them changed. But my top five strengths in order is number one, competition. That hasn't changed. Interesting. Number two, ideation. Uh, People with this talent are fascinated by ideas. Yup, that sounds like me. Number three, strategic. People who create alternative ways to proceed faced with any given scenario also sounds like me. Number four, restorative, adept at dealing with problems. Hmm, (laughs) not so sure about that, but I'll take it. And number five, significance. People with significance want to make a big impact. It was really fun to read about these and I'm actually just digging into my results right now. I hope that you enjoyed this conversation. I hope that you're enjoying the show. If you ever have feedback, if you want to reach out to me, if you want to submit a listener question in the show notes, there are a bunch of links to my Instagram and to submit a listener question and to get in touch with me. I love hearing from you. I appreciate you so, so much. And I'm really excited because we have another episode coming next week with more of Caitlin. And it's such a good one. It is so much fun. So I can't wait for you to hear it. And with that, I'm going to sign off and catch you later. Bye.